Hello everyone, my name is Father Joseph Doyle. I am a Josephite priest, currently living at St. Augustine High School in New Orleans, but also helping Father Jeff Bahi at his parish in Zachary, St. John the Baptist Parish in Zachary, Louisiana. And I'm happy to be here today, Divine Mercy Sunday. And perhaps you notice the beautiful banner that we have that goes all the way back to Father Harold Cohen. Uh, Father Cohen was the founder of Closer Walk Ministries, and Father Jeff Bahi has continued the wonderful work that these ministries are doing. So it's a great joy to be here on Divine Mercy Sunday. Uh, actually, it's the uh, Sunday in the octave of Easter, but thanks to St. John Paul II and to the, uh, the work that Sister Faustina Kowalska did um, with her diary and promoting Divine Mercy, we celebrate the feast now as the Sunday of Divine Mercy, a beautiful feast day. Some of you might remember when we called it Low Sunday. Uh, I, I remember uh, in our Josephite parishes on Low Sunday, the Knights of Peter Claver would turn out along with the Ladies Auxiliary and uh, probably to do or fulfill their Easter duty. Um, maybe some of you remember that term as well. The Easter duty, one of the uh, precepts of the church. Uh, we know there are 10 commandments, but um, some people might not know that there are also church commandments called the precepts of the church in the, uh, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. There are five of them. And today on Divine Mercy Sunday, I'd like to speak about two because they're connected with the feast today. The second precept is this. You shall confess your sins at least once a year. And the third, you shall receive the sacrament of the Eucharist at least during the Easter season. These are two of the five precepts of the Catholic Church. So let's go to number two. You shall confess your sins at least once a year. The sacrament of reconciliation is the sacrament of divine mercy. Um, if you come to visit us, and you're always welcome at uh, St. John the Baptist Church, and you look at the, uh, at the confessionals, Father Bahi was instrumental in setting up the interior of that church the exterior is new. The interior comes from uh, an old church that was abandoned. And so the, the old original confessionals were brought into the new church in Zachary. And over the entrance to the confessional where the priest would go in, there are two side doors for the penitents, the middle door for the priest. And over his entrance are the cross keys, the two keys symbolizing the authority that was given to Peter and his successors. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. Whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. So that symbol, that hand-carved, beautiful piece of art over the confessional is a reminder to the penitents where the authority comes from for that person to go in and come out with their sins forgiven. And it's a reminder also uh, to the priest about the authority that he has and where he got it from. Uh, it really comes from the bishop of the diocese or the archbishop who gives us what are called faculties, uh, the faculties to hear confessions in a particular diocese. If for some reason uh, he should find that uh, maybe the priest does, does not deserve these faculties, he can remove them and say, Father, you are no longer allowed to hear confession in this diocese. So that, that shows you how much authority the bishop has. And he gives it to the priest when he comes in to work in a particular diocese. So I love that the, the beautiful symbol of the keys resting right over the confessional. That's the outside. And then sometimes uh, in various confessionals, uh, the penitent can go to confession face to face. So they walk in and look around and see on the wall various pictures 
Uh, probably the most popular is the one by Rembrandt. It was used during the Year of Mercy, and it shows the prodigal son returning to his father and being embraced by his father. Uh, there are other pictures, of course, that could, would be very appropriate inside a confessional. Uh, we have, for example, uh, the woman caught in adultery when Jesus saves her from being stoned to death. And so here again is mercy extended to this woman who was caught in adultery. Uh, same way with the woman at the well. Uh, that's another sign of God's mercy, that how patient he was with that woman. It's incredible. So with all three of these examples, uh, pictures that you might see in a given confessional, uh, they all represent mercy and misery meeting. Jesus the mercy, meeting the miserable sinner. Because someone who is caught up in a life of sin is not happy. They're, they're miserable. They need to be forgiven and healed. And that's what this sacrament is all about. That's what today is all about. The sacrament of mercy, reconciliation. But then we go back to the um, precept of the church, which requires confession once a year. Now that's especially if, if it's a mortal sin to be confessed. Uh, it's not necessary to go if there are no mortal sins to be confessed, but it's a good idea anyhow. Uh, it's good for us to go to confession frequently, at least once a month, to come face to face with our sinfulness. But confession once a year as a precept, uh, why should we be Catholic minimalist, just doing the, what is required? Uh, there's no joy and happiness in that. When the floodgates of grace and mercy are opened in each and every confession, they are poured forth from the Blessed Trinity. Actually, the Sacrament of Reconciliation is a Trinitarian experience. Um, just listen to the words of absolution. Now, when I give these, I'm not absolving everybody who's watching today. But you've heard them before. Hopefully, uh, you will hear them again. But uh, the, the beautiful words of absolution that let us know that we are now back in favor with the divine trinity. And it's through the trinity that we are absolved. The priest will say the words of absolution but the forgiveness comes from God and from God alone. So, the words of the absolution. God, the Father of mercies, starts right out there when the priest absolves you from your sins. God, the Father of mercy, first person of the Blessed Trinity, through the death and resurrection of his Son, second person of the Blessed Trinity, Jesus Christ has sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. So you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit sent by the Father uh, for the forgiveness of sins. And then the priest continues. Through the ministry of the church, so the continuation of, of Christ's divine work and his work of salvation is through the church. Through the ministry of the church, may God give you pardon and peace. And I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then the penitent will thank the priest for being there, being available to hear the confession. And the priest will say, go in peace. And the penitent will most likely give thanks to God for that opportunity. So the sacrament, I think, speaks for itself. The sacrament of reconciliation, what, what more do we really need to say? Uh, it's a beautiful sacrament, and it's one that we need to take advantage of frequently. Today we see everybody going to communion, but not that many people standing in line as we used to years ago. Uh, I remember as, as a young person, uh, every Saturday, Four o'clock in the afternoon, we go up to the church and there would be two or three priests hearing confessions, and there would be lines of people waiting to get in. Uh, we don't see that anymore. And one of the reasons, I think, is because we don't have that consciousness of sin. 
that everything seems to be okay. Everybody else is doing it, why can't I? So without that uh, appreciation, the idea of putting the proper price on the beautiful sacrament of reconciliation, we no longer see long lines. Occasionally we'll see someone uh, who has been touched by grace, by the amazing grace that brings about conversion and reconciliation with Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So I urge you uh, to, uh, to take advantage of this beautiful sacrament. I remember on Divine Mercy Sunday with, with Father Cohen at St. Joseph's Church in, uh, in New Orleans and later on other churches as well. People desiring to go to confession on this particular day, which is not necessary. Uh, you can go any time during the Easter season. Um, which would be uh, in the United States from the first Sunday of Lent all the way up to Trinity Sunday. Uh, in other countries, it might be a shorter amount of time. But uh, back in the old days, everybody wanted to go to confession on Divine Mercy Sunday. And so we had to bring in priests from all over the city and outside the city to hear confessions until the bishop brought it to the attention of people that you don't have to go on that particular day. I think it's because of what was written in uh, St. Faustina's diary that emphasizes the day itself as being the day of divine mercy. So uh, that's one of the uh, precepts of the Catholic Church. They're mentioned in the Catechism of the Catholic Church uh, for you to read at your convenience. And when we come back after a short break, uh, we will uh, look at the other precept of the Catholic Church, which is receiving the sacrament of the Eucharist at least during the Easter season. So once again, during the Easter season, first Sunday of Lent to Trinity Sunday, confession, Holy Eucharist. May God bless you. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bayou from Close to Walk Catholic Communications. Thank you for being here today. And a special thanks for the support that you give us. First of all, your prayerful support we so desperately need, and also your financial support. We are donor-driven, and that would, is what keeps us on the air today. As you well know, the truth is in great demand and in very short supply, and mainstream media is not going to bring you the truth of the Gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ because that's not socially acceptable, and it's not politically correct. Certainly, we all realize that when this life journey's over, we don't stand before the Supreme Court, we stand before the throne of God. Therefore, with great clarity and great charity, to pronounce the truth of the gospel is important. Your prayers, your financial support enables us to do that. So we thank you, and may God bring you close in your walk with the Lord each day. God bless you. Welcome back, everyone. We've been talking about the precepts of the church, and today, Divine Mercy Sunday, focusing on two. But I'd like to read all five, just in case you might not be familiar with the precepts of the Catholic Church. And the first, you shall attend Mass on Sundays and on holy days of obligation, and rest from servile labor. Um, we're all familiar with the third commandment uh, of keeping holy the Sabbath day, and going to Mass is the way that we as Catholics fulfill that obligation and respond to that commandment. But the Church, in its precepts, makes that a little more specific. You are to go to Holy Mass and the Holy Days of Obligation. So that's the first precept of the Church. The second we talked about in the last session, you shall confess your sins at least once a year, and it ensures preparation for the Eucharist by the reception of the Sacrament of Reconciliation, which continues baptism's work of conversion and forgiveness. Unfortunately, maybe a century or two ago, some people had the idea that you had to go to confession before you went to Holy Communion. You do if you have mortal sins on your soul. Yes, you do, but not for venial sins. 
It's always good to confess them, but actually in the Eucharist, our venial sins are taken away if we're sorry and if we try to avoid these sins in the future. But that's through the Eucharist. Uh, so the, uh, the precept of the church tells us to confess our sins at least once a year, and if there are any serious mortal sins, they have to be confessed before receiving the Eucharist. The third precept, you shall receive the sacrament of the Eucharist at least during the Easter season. And once again, it's, it's kind of a minimalist thing. Uh, it guarantees as a minimum the reception of the Lord's body and blood in connection with the Paschal Feast, the origin and center of the Christian liturgy. So that's why the church says, receive the Eucharist during Easter time because it's connected with the Last Supper and actually the Sacred Triduum, uh, with the Last Supper and then Christ's death and his resurrection, all put together making up the Paschal mystery. So when we confess our sins, when we receive the Eucharist during this time of year, it has not only great symbolism, but great effectiveness because of the graces that are being offered. Then there's the fourth precept of the church. You shall observe the days of fasting and abstinence established by the church. We've been through Lent, and we've tried to fulfill this obligation as well, this precept. And then finally, the fifth precept, you shall help to provide for the needs of the church. Now here they're talking about mainly the, the local church and specifically your parish church that there is an obligation through the precepts of the church to support your parish and school, if you're fortunate enough to have a school attached to your parish. Uh, th this is a, a precept. It's, it's almost like a commandment um, that we do have an obligation to take care of, of the parish where we belong. We're part of that community, and so there is an obligation to support it. So I thought I'd share all five of those precepts with you before we get into the, uh, the precept uh, dealing with today, the, the Eucharist. Uh, here is another sacrament of divine mercy. And uh, in the precept, we're told you shall receive the sacrament of the Eucharist at least during the Easter season. Once again, in the United States from the first Sunday of Lent, to Trinity Sunday, but right in the middle, right at the heart of, of all of the feasts of the church is Easter. And it's Easter when we have the greatest appreciation for the seven sacraments, but especially the two that we're focusing on during this season of divine mercy. Once again, trying not to be minimalistic, mediocre, or lukewarm when it comes to the reception of the sacraments. We know what Jesus said about those who were lukewarm. He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, those are very serious words coming from our Savior, but I think it addresses a situation that we find today in many places in the church uh, of a minimalistic approach, just doing enough to get by just living a life so that when I die, I can sort of squeeze through the gate uh, or ask our Blessed Mother to open the rear window so you can climb in. Um, no, we don't want to be minimalist. Uh, we want to do as much as we can out of love for Almighty God, for His love for us, the, the, out of love for His mercy that we celebrate today, out of love especially uh, for the Holy Eucharist, the sacrament of redemption. It was at the Last Supper that Jesus said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So it's through the blood of the Eucharist that our venial sins are forgiven, but it's in the sacrament of, of reconciliation or penance that our mortal sins are forgiven by the blood of Christ on the cross. So it all revolves around Jesus Christ pouring out his precious blood so that our sins can be forgiven 
and so that we can have food and drink for the journey in life. So to remember that, um, that uh, if there are any mortal sins on our souls, uh, they have to be confessed. For the most part, there are a few exceptions, but for the most part, uh, if at all possible, confess your serious sins before going to communion. Otherwise, there's another sin added, and that is sacrilege. Uh, once again, we, we know that uh, these sins, in order to be mortal, um, have to be deliberate. They have to be planned. They have to be thought about, appreciated. Uh, and once we know all of those things and do it anyhow, that's where it becomes a mortal sin. Jesus gives us his body and blood as spiritual food for the journey. It is his real presence. Out of mercy for us, out of divine mercy, he wanted to be with us always. He did not want to leave us orphans, and he has not. His divine mercy is present in the Eucharist, and in so many places we have the opportunity to go into an adoration chapel and say the Divine Mercy Chaplet, along with the rosary, along with silent time before the Lord. Sometimes uh, when we go before the Lord in adoration, we do all the talking. I don't think that's the best approach. The best approach is to go in silently, and after we've said our prayers, to listen uh, in silence for God to speak to us. He will speak. Uh, the best way to prepare for that is, is by reading scripture or by saying the prayers and meditating, for example, when we say the rosary, on the mysteries. So in the presence of, of Jesus, in his divine presence, his real presence, whether it's at Holy Mass or in an adoration chapel, Jesus is with us until the end of the time, the end of the world. He wants us to to be with him. He wants us to, it's a mutual relationship. He wants to be with us. We should have the desire and the grace to be with him. It was in one of the Easter readings, we remember the beautiful story of the road to Emmaus, the two disciples, Cleopas and possibly his son, Simon, uh, going back to their home in Emmaus, and Jesus joins them. And then later on, he opens for them the meaning of the scriptures as they pertain to uh, what the Messiah had to do and what he had to go through in order to win salvation for all people. And the, their remark was, uh, our, our hearts were burning when he spoke to us. They were so on fire, so desirous to hear more, so desirous to have Jesus with them that they said to him before he departed, or he was pretending to depart, stay with us, Lord, it is nearly evening. Stay with us, Lord, as evening draws near. Mane nabisca, nabisca domine, stay with us, Lord. And that's what we uh, pray for today, that God will always be with us, that we will experience his divine mercy. One thing I might uh, end up on talking about uh, uh, divine mercy, and that is the power of the divine mercy chaplet when someone is seriously ill. If the family can gather together around a, a very sick person, a dying person, and recite together the divine mercy chaplet, it is a powerful experience. I've seen it in my own pastoral ministry. I've seen when people say the divine mercy chaplet that the individual will die at three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, it tells us something about our pleading for someone who might not be able to plead at that time. We're praying for them, that God will have mercy on them at the end of their life. So that's a wonderful practice. Uh, even every day, we try to say the Divine Mercy Chaplet we need it during these particular times that are going on in the world, worldwide, crises of every kind. And so to pray for God's mercy on his children, and he will listen, and he will extend his mercy. But we have to do so individually, first of all. And once we've experienced the mercy of God and the forgiveness of God, we can testify, give testimony on that, and that will bring other people into the fold. 
when they will know that somebody has experienced the mercy of God in his or her life. So I hope that for the end of this day, when we celebrate God's merciful love for us, that we can take time out to let God know how grateful we are for the mercy that he has given us. If you don't know the Divine Mercy Chaplet, usually in the back of the church, uh, you will find little pamphlets, or you can go online and order information or see it right there on your screen, directions on how to say the Divine Mercy Chaplet and the history of the devotion to Divine Mercy and the life and work of Sister Faustina Kowalska. So it's a beautiful feast that we celebrate today. I hope and pray that the graces of this feast will be with you now and always. Amen. And may God bless you. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bay from Closer Walk Catholic Communications. Join us here in this station each week as we strive to bring you the gospel message with great clarity and great charity. And may God bless you in your walk each day. Jesus Christ, when you walk the earth, you travel the countryside through towns and villages, curing every disease and illness among the people. At your command, all who approach you in illness were made well, made whole. Now, Lord, we implore you to blanket our world with your love and your healing presence. Open the hearts of all to turn back to you in their hearts and to seek you in all things. We pray that for all who have been infected and affected by the coronavirus may find their strength in you. For those who have died may find their rest in you. Guide the leaders of all nations to work together for the family of man, working to help all in need out of love for all mankind. Give grace, courage, and strength to all medical professionals who put their well-being in harm's way for the sake of others. We pray for your guidance through the waters of uncertainty and for a sense of your presence as we place our trust in you. Gracious God and Father, may this crisis bring your healing presence to a wounded world so that mentally, spiritually, and physically, we may return to you in all things. Amen. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bay from Closer Walk Catholic Communications. Thank you for being here today, and a special thanks for the support that you give us. First of all, your prayerful support we so desperately need, and also your financial support. We are donor-driven, and that is what keeps us on the air today. As you well know, the truth is in great demand and in very short supply, and mainstream media is not going to bring you the truth of the Gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ because that's not socially acceptable and it's not politically correct. Certainly we all realize that when this life journey is over, we don't stand before the Supreme Court, we stand before the throne of God. Therefore, with great clarity and great charity, to pronounce the truth of the Gospel is important. Your prayers, your financial support, enables us to do that. So we thank you, and may God bring you closer in your walk with the Lord each day. God bless you.